Um, thank you very much. And I have to say that I'm the one honored to be here today. You can see the two institutions ganging up to give me a platform to hear my own voice. And, you know, we entrepreneurs like sometimes uh, to hear our own voice. But I'm, I'm delighted to be here because I think also it might be a, a force for good. The thing about entrepreneurs is that we, we learn from each other, we watch what uh, we do, and you know, maybe I can inspire other people to spend more of their time and money giving back to society. I also like it interactive, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions just to make sure you're listening. Um, how many of you were stranded overseas as a result of the last seven days? All right. Thank you very much for making. How many of you had to fly back on EasyJet? Okay, you see. <laughs> okay, good, excellent. How many of you are stranded in London? That's why you're here. That's why you didn't have anything better to do. <laughs> Great. Um, how many of you consider yourselves entrepreneurs? Oh, good, good. Quite a few in the audience. Excellent. Well, I, you know, I... I consider myself an entrepreneur, although I'm not self-made, and it's best to get this admission out of the way early. Um, I cheated because I had a rich father. And, you know, I went to him and asked for money, and he was generous enough and um, uh, kind enough to finance my first business at the age of 25, which was in the shipping business, like my father. But you can imagine the conversation when I went back to him at the age of 28 to ask for £5 million to start an airline based in Luton, that would take people to Glasgow for 29 pounds. You know, what he said in Greek is probably un unrepeatable, but um, I, I convinced him. He, was, he, had the, uh, he had the foresight to see that it would be a good investment. And, you know, the result, as you know, is the company called EasyJet. Um, the thing about, you know, um, growing older, obviously, and you know, having achieved some of your objectives in, in business is that you start feeling guilty, if I can use that expression. You start feeling you have a debt to repay to society. And I know some people like to use less emotive words, but I don't have a problem with it. I think we do have an obligation to give back something to society. At the end of the day, it's, it's the people who bought our products and services and sort of created the financial success. So some of it has to go back. Now, there are different ways of giving back, and that's where I'm going to um, express my views and my thoughts. Um, you know, put some questions to you, if you like, and then open it up for debate, because there is no right and wrong when it comes to giving back. For example, um, I started my first, you know, serious recurring, if you like, project on philanthropy was going back to my alma mater, my, the university I graduated from. So I'm a graduate of the London School of Economics, and I thought if I um, give scholarships to the London School of Economics, then I'll help, uh, you know, needier students than me to go and get a good degree and then go and change the world. You know, institutions like the London School of Economics have this amazing ability to manufacture, you know, world leaders as well. I mean, 60 heads of states have been there. Um, so education became one of my first pillars, if you like, in my giving back. I went to the City University, which is where I got my master's degree. So now there are... Um, you know, 20 graduates every year that go through this system and become the, alum the, the, the alumni, if you like, of, of, of my program. These people will go and make a, a difference to their businesses, to their countries, their families. Um, you know, some of them work for Goldman Sachs already, which a few years ago would have been <laughs> impressive. Or a few, a few weeks ago would have been more impressive than now. I think a couple have joined HSBC. It's excellent. But, um, you know, some of them will become politicians. Some of them, you know, really want to go back to their country and become finance ministers. So it's, it's an amazing mix of people. And I call that the exponential effect. You know, the five or 10,000 a year to a student is one thing. The fact that that person can go and create exponential change, I think, is more important. It's interesting that you're involved in education, for example, which I assume is the same exponential effect you're, you're looking for. The, the second area I like to get involved is entrepreneurship. Because I think we should stick to what we think we're good at, what we enjoy doing, what you know, would bring us closer to people that we relate to. If, for example, you're asking a footballer to contribute back to society, more likely to do it through football. Um, an artist through art. But you know, I'm neither of the, of the two, so I decided to try and give back through inspiring entrepreneurship. 
Now, you'd say, why, why giving £50,000 to a business is philanthropy? Well, um, you have to find an angle to it. I mean, it cannot be just writing checks. But at the same time, think how much impact a business can have on the world. We're really talking about exponential effect. If you succeed in making a startup make it through the difficult period and then go and change the world, or change their industry, or change their country, or change their sector, or even their town, it doesn't have to be uh, global, then your 50,000 went a lot, a lot further. And it's also easier because I relate to these people. So, you know, I started awards. The first one in the UK is the one we're hosting together next month and later in the year, where it's about disabled entrepreneurs. The, the, the corresponding charity there is Lena Cheshire, well known from the um, homes. And the idea is that um, if you help a disabled person who started a business with an award that gives them recognition, it gives them cash flow as well, which helps, and they succeed and you know, go through that you know, uh, difficult period of three to five years, then you build a sustainable business. My first winner three years ago was a, a blind tour operator, a guy who lost his sight and decided that the best way to make money is to set up a tour operation business that combines blind and sighted people going on holiday together and the one subsidizing the other. And again, it might be only someone who's blind who can actually think of something like that and make it happen. Uh, the second one was a profoundly deaf person that set up a translation website via webcam, so from sign language to English. And the, the recent winner, the most recent one, third one in, in line now, um, is an amputee. He lost his arm in a, in a motorcycling accident. And then had this idea, I think the way it went is he got a job as an extra in the movie Saving Private Ryan. Do you remember Saving Private Ryan with uh, Tom Hanks? They needed many extras with, who were amputees without arms to, to play the soldiers. So he got the job, got some money, and then started looking around and said there is demand for this thing. So he now runs an agency that places amputees in films in Hollywood. And, and you know, this guy is doing very well, and with my support, I think he's a speaker at the event on the 12th of, of, of May. He's become a, an inspirational speaker because it's so difficult, actually, to start a business from these circumstances and survive. And the, the first year's guy is still in business because that's the other embarrassing thing with supporting entrepreneurs. They may sort of go out of business, but they seem to have done well. In Greece, which is my birthplace, I um, set up an award for young entrepreneurs under, under 40 because it's a smaller country, less entrepreneurial, so you need something... More, more generic. And in Cyprus, which is the country of origin of my parents, there's a special situation. It's a bit like um, the Nicosia, the capital, is like a, a cross between Berlin, before the wall came down, and Jerusalem. It's, it's a very difficult situation because it's, um, it's still divided, but there are some crossings now. But the problem is there are two cultures and two religions and two languages on the island. So the social interaction is not the same as it was in Berlin when they opened the wall. You know, they, they were you know, similar, and therefore they very quickly got together again. In Cyprus, you go, and the, you know, the, the boundary is there. You can cross. But very few people do. And of course, you know, when, when, when that boundary has been there 35 years, you have a whole generation of people who think the other side, you know, eat babies for breakfast, basically. <laughs> and that works both ways. So um, I decided the best way to break down that barrier is to help them do business with each other. So I give um, 50,000 pounds per joint venture, to, per team that involves one Greek Cypriot and one Turkish Cypriot doing business together. And again, it's, it's what you expect. The first winners, it's just we're in the second year now, are people who um, you know, do the businesses that are prevalent on the island. Agriculture, building materials, a car rental firm, you know. It's never occurred to me that if you're in car rental, you couldn't actually cross the border because as soon as you did, the insurance was invalidated. So, you know, you, you had to have you know, a joint venture with someone on the other side to, to pick it up. So it's, you know, simple, small ideas like that that I think can help the two communities get closer together. And I'll, um, I'll end the um, this speech part with um, a question op opening it up for debate. In other words, it's food for thought. I don't know which is right and which is wrong. Um, as your name suggests, you focus on Africa, which is probably the, the poorest continent. 
the neediest people on the planet you know, probably live there. Um, what I described as my um, philanthropic activity started closer to home, started in my alma mater, in my university, which, you know, although not every student um, at the LSE has a rich Greek ship owner as a father, um, you know, they're not exactly as needy as the, the kids in Africa that you're supporting. So do you go um, support, trying to find the neediest and help them, which might be far away in another continent, you know, away from home, or do you stay closer to home? Do you help the brightest, the most competent, the most you know, intelligent, you know, able, disabled able, if you know what I mean? Or, or do you go actually for someone that you know, has such a disability that cannot even get out of, of bed, for example? So all, all of these are moral issues which I don't know the answers. I don't think there's a right and a wrong. The good thing about philanthropy is there are many ways of doing it. I mean, I stand up and speak about it because I like to hear my own voice, as I admitted already, there are people who just write very discreetly a check and hand the check to charity and never talk about it again. You know, I think it's less satisfying, at least for my personality, but I'm sure you're welcoming those donations as well. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I started a relationship by just writing a check during an event, during a gala dinner, so you have to start somewhere. I still have the African hobby horse, actually, in my <laughs> office. <laughs> so, um, you know, you have to choose how you want to give back. You know, if you have a, a passion or a talent, maybe you want to do it that way. But you know, I think uh, discrete checks are equally welcome. On this note, thank you very much, and I'll answer your questions. <laughs>